Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to you, to the mothers in here. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And if you're just joining us for the first time, we are going through a short series in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Last week we walked through the second half of chapter 2, and now we'll split up chapter 3 into two different messages between this week and next week, if the Lord wills. And so just so you know where we're going and and where we're going to end up, since we'll close out our time in Ecclesiastes at the end of this month, my plan is to finish chapter 3 next week, and then on the last Sunday, I'll just cover the rest of the book. Um, Not verse by verse, of course. I know some of you were getting a little nervous there. Um, That would take all day and all evening. Unless you're down for that kind of thing. I don't know. We could do it. Uh, But the plan is to wrap up the book by hitting really the high points of Ecclesiastes from chapter 4 all the way to the remaining uh, chapters and then close out um, with Solomon's conclusion um, uh, in chapter 12 to take us home. Of course, those are plans, right? We'll see what the Lord does. Uh, But for right now, here we go. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Uh, verse 1 through verse 11, Solomon says, There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up what is lost. To give up as lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time for love and a time for hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? I have seen the, the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from beginning even to the end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time bringing us to your word. We pray that you would have rule over our hearts and our minds in this hour. Let us come away with from this time of, of teaching and this time of learning and this time of instruction to hear what you have to say to us, Lord, so we may apply to our lives and we can walk in wisdom in a way that glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, before we start the book of Ecclesiastes, if you remember, we went over some of the top major themes of the book, and I mentioned that we were going to run into a few more uh, as, we, uh, as, we, as, we, as we continue on in our study. And um, if you didn't pick up on it yet, a major theme in this chapter is time, time. The word time appeared multiple times in our passage today. There'll be some more in the other half of this chapter. And as well as other references pertaining to time like eternity and and beginning to end in verse 11. And if you've been with us through this series, it's clear that Ecclesiastes is a book that is very relevant uh, to life because it it deals so much with the human experience. I'm sure you would agree with that. And nothing really could be more part of the human experience than, than time. On earth, we are, we're all subject to time. Our lives are governed by time, controlled by it, every single day. But for something that's a part of the human experience, something that we're closely intimate 
with every single day and so natural to the human experience, it always seems like us and time are never on the same page. And be- because of time, we have to wake, wake up and get out of bed at a time when we would rather stay in bed, right? Sometimes the urgency of time tells us it's time to to leave from good company when we'd rather just stay and talk. If we'll be honest, we really don't like time all that much. Time either forces us to hurry or it forces us to wait. For example, just speaking to the youth here, I'm sure some, for you, some of you, as it was for me, when you're young, you, you want to get older as soon as possible, right? You know, someone asks you how old you are, and if you're close to your next birthday, you might throw in that extra time to your age and say, I'm, you know, I'm 10 and a half, right? I'm almost 13. The future looks attractive at a young age, and it seems that time is just not moving fast enough for you. You wish you could speed it up, but, but you, you just can't, can you? Here's some news for you, if your parents didn't tell you this. It all goes backwards when you hit around 40 years old. You look back and you wish you were 20 again. Time is moving too fast for you at this point. Before the future looked attractive and and now that the future has become the present, the past looks more attractive to you now. And you wish you could go back to the prime of your life and live it all over again, but the fact of the matter is you can't, can you? Time rules us in the decisions that we make every day in life. Derek Kidner, commentator, points this out. He says that time is imposed upon men, imposed upon us. And that's because time itself is a creation of God. God created time back in Genesis chapter 1 as he created the earth and he set in motion this cycle of evening and morning. Out of nothing, ex nihilo, came everything. And out of eternity, time was created. And from that time, God has used time to orchestrate events under heaven to bring about his own purposes for his own glory. So time is a master to us, but it is a slave to God. And not only is time used to bring about God's plan, and we see this all the way through Scripture. There's not a place where this isn't, this isn't evident. But it's also used to bring us to the end of ourselves. To help us to realize that we're not masters of our own domain here on this earth. That even though God gives us responsibilities and, and opportunities and even the ability to, to plan out certain aspects of our lives, that ultimately we have no authority, no control, no say in the matter in regards to the final result. And this has been a realization of our author here, King Solomon, who writes from the experience of a man in power of the kingdom of Israel, the the kingdom of the chosen people of the creator of heaven and earth, Yahweh, That same creator that established Solomon in power also gave Solomon immeasurable wisdom and wealth that had been guaranteed to go unsurpassed in this life. And however, as Solomon realized in chapter one, much wisdom, he says, leads to much grief and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. The the, the grief and the pain that Solomon experienced was this realization that, that life in this world is fleeting. He often referred to it as vanity, striving after the wind, as it provides no source of satisfaction or lasting value. He said in verse one, I mean, verse uh, three of chapter one, he says, what advantage does man have in all his work in which he does after the sun? And so in chapter two, he recounted this experience that he had when he plunged himself into this life of escapism in an attempt to escape the curse and to go out on an all-out expedition uh, for the sake of pleasure and enjoyment. He, he left nothing on the table. He invested all of his times into worldly 
pursuits indulging in the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. And at the end of it all, the experience left him even more empty to, to the degree that in, in verse 17 of chapter 2, he says that he hated life. It says, for the work which I had done under the sun was grievous to me. For everything is futility and, and striving after the wind. And then Solomon realized that all he had worked so hard for was worthless. And at the end of his life, someone else would inherit what he, labeled to, what he labored to produce, which was completely out of his control. Verse 21 of chapter 2, when there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. This too is vanity and a great evil which left him full circle back to the same place he started. He says in the next verse, what, for what does a man get in all his labor and his striving with which he labors under the sun? His pursuit was pointless and worthless because God was not in it. He attempted to seek for pleasure and, and, and satisfaction outside of the providence, the, the providence and, and care of God. A huge piece missing out of this puzzle that he created. However, by the end of this chapter, Solomon resolves this puzzle when he considers God and, and the simple but excellent gifts that he gives us through our work. That only, that only what, it, what, what is satisfiable can be satisfied. And in that, God gives abundant grace. He says in verse 24, there is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? And so as we get into chapter 2, it's here that the preacher Solomon brings God to the, the, the forefront to give us the right perspective about life in this world. And here in chapter 3, he continues this this God-conscious uh, perspective by providing us two tools that God uses to sovereignly control the lives and the hearts of men. And it's simply this, events in verses 1 through 8, and then eternity in verses 9 through 11. Events, events, verses 1 through 8. Look at verse 1. He says, there is an appointed time for everything. The word used for time most often is the Hebrew word yom, yom. And the first time it occurs is in Genesis 1-5. It's usually translated day because it refers to a 24-hour period. And these hours make up days and days make up months and months make up years and so on and so forth. And this word yom could also be translated as seasons. Yom is used 30 times in chapter 3 alone. However, the word Solomon uses is here is a different word used for time. It's a word zimon, which actually means appointed time. Appointed time. Solomon, in his wisdom, carefully chose this word very, very carefully and specifically here to differentiate it from the other instances of the word trans that we translate time, yom. And he was so specific that he used a non-Hebrew word of Semitic origin, a Aramaic word. And this word is used only four times in the Old Testament, used twice in Esther and the other time in Nehemiah. Now, Esther and Nehemiah are both post-exilic books. These are books that were written after Israel's exile into Babylon, far after Solomon existed. And for this reason, because of the presence of this Aramaic word in Ecclesiastes, it's actually led some commentators to, to believe that Solomon did not write Ecclesiastes just because of that one word. However, since Arameans have been around since the time of the book of Genesis and of course, language has always been around, the Aramean language. 
Arameans also were included in the bloodline of Israel, so it wouldn't be foreign to, uh, be, for Solomon to, to be familiar with the, the language of the Arameans. But Solomon chooses this word so that it would stand out and make a statement that, that there is not just time, but he says that there is an appointed time for everything. And this is significant because time cannot appoint itself, can it? It is subject to the one who created time. And as we know from Genesis 1, this is God. God not only controls time, but he, he uses time. He designates time. He prearranges time. You can even say that he schedules it. And this means that God did not just set the clock on time in, 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 in creation, uh, kind of beginning it and setting it in motion and, and just letting uh, things play out at random. No, he ordained it for his own purpose. Furthermore, notice that Solomon, notice what Solomon did not say. There is an appointed time for certain things. You don't have that in your Bible, do you? No, there's an appointed time for what? Everything. Everything. And the fact that it has been appointed or determined not only points to God's sovereignty, but it also points to man's inability to control everything in life or anything in life. Nothing is ultimately left up to us. And then he says in the next expression, and there is a time for every event under heaven. Now this word translated as events is usually translated delight or desire in the Old Testament which again refers to God's sovereign control. That his, his, he designed things and designated things to occur in life according to his own plan, according to his own purpose and his own pleasure, which is always perfect. Notice also that Solomon referred to these events as being under heaven. Now, by this time, we're used to Solomon saying the word or the phrase under the sun. It's a phrase that shows up 27 times in the, the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a term that speaks to life on earth, the human experience. We live under the sun, especially here in Southern California, which is the epitome of the human experience. But in other words, this world is the realm of man. Man's dominion, so to speak. We are under the sun. But the phrase here, the phrase used here, under heaven, is not merely being used interchangeably with under the sun. Because heaven is where God is. It is God's realm of authority. And later on in chapter 5, Solomon says, For God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Heaven is where God is. And though under the sun is different from under heaven, they are not separate from one another. If you remember that everything that is under the sun is still under heaven, which means that it's under the sovereign rule and authority of God and imposed upon our human experience under the sun, God in heaven has ordained an appointed time for all things for every event under heaven. And we'll look at a couple of examples in, in the following verses, but, but just take this one fact, for example. Just consider for a minute your salvation in every event that had to occur in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ in order to save us from the wrath of God. Better yet, turn with me to the book of John to see it in action. John chapter 7. Now, though Jesus' coming was foretold thousands of years in advance, Jesus came from heaven and was born in the flesh through the womb of Mary at the appointed time. Thirty years later, Jesus began his ministry, and at the same time, he began to shake things up. His words and his works challenged the religious authorities, and there was already a hit out on Jesus Christ. 
Men began to seek to kill him, and this was publicly known. Look down at verse 25 of chapter 7 in John. It says, so some of the people in Jerusalem were saying, is this not the man whom they are seeking to kill? And here in chapter 7, they are at the Feast of Booths. And an opportunity to take Jesus presented itself. Yet they were prevented from doing anything to him due to nothing else but the appointed time had not yet arrived. Look at verse 30. So they were seeking to seize him and no man laid, on, laid his hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And then fast forward to chapter 8 verse 20. Another opportunity came. Look with me there. Verse 20 of chapter 8. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one sees him because his hour had not yet come. And though the time was not yet, it was approaching. Turn with me to chapter 13, verse 1. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, knowing Jesus, knowing that his hour had come and that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Turn to chapter 16, verse 32. Behold, an hour is coming, Jesus says to his disciples, and has already come. For you to be scattered each to his own home, to leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. And then look at chapter 17, verse 1, in Jesus' high priestly prayer. It says, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. And you don't have to turn there. But in Matthew chapter 26, as Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and here he was being betrayed by Judas or getting ready to be betrayed by Judas, one of his hand-selected disciples, another foretold event that had to take place leading to, God's or, to, to his God-orchestrated death. It says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 45, Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. And then in verse 55, it says, At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you not come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching you, and teaching you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left, and left him and fled. It was an appointed time. And then at the appointed time, he was nailed to a cross to die under the right, under the wrath of God for the sins of those who would believe on him for eternal life. And this is why Paul in Romans chapter 5 verse 6 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Our salvation in the events that led up to it, leading to the most major event in the history of humanity was all brought about because of God's designated appointed time. And every moment of time before that was ordained by God, appointed by God. And as amazing as, and, and important as this event was, Solomon says here that all of the events in life are appointed by God as well. And to illustrate this in the following seven verses here in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon gives us 28 examples of just some of the events that we all experience in our lives that have been appointed by God. The first one is here, look at verse 2. A time to give birth and a time to die. Now though we are all born into this world at the appointed time that God established, Solomon starts from the perspective as the mother, as she is the one giving birth. See, something for Mother's Day right there in Ecclesiastes. And as you know, the woman carries a child, and her time to give birth is due usually in nine months. 
But the time of delivery is appointed by God. No one knows when that is. The mother has no control over that, neither does the baby. As for me, I was born two months before my due date. I was born into this world immature. You can ask my wife, she'll confirm to you. (laughs) My daughter was born one week past her due date. God determines the day and the minute of birth. But it's the same thing with death. And this is a very difficult thing to grasp because to us, death is one of the most unanticipated things that we have to deal with in this world. No one's expecting it. No one's looking forward to it. We never want to see it coming, and many times we don't. We, we can't. We never know when might be the last time that we see each other in this life. And though we know that there will be such a day, it's hidden to us, but it's appointed by God, however that comes about. And in his eyes, there really is no such thing as an untimely death. If you remember Job chapter 14, verse 5, and I probably say it every week, since his days are determined, the, the number of his months is with you and his limits you have set that he cannot pass. Then Solomon says next, he says, a, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. This is similar to the birth of humans. Uh, God who has, has ordained a, a gestation period for all plants and crops. There's a seven-day, there's a seven-stage life cycle for each plant, each fruit tree, each vegetable on the vine. But depending on that plant, certain crops have a best time to plant and a best time to be harvested. There's a certain window of time in which those seeds can be planted and, and a point in time in which they will come out of the ground and be harvested or uprooted. And then we have, look at verse 3, a time to kill and a time to heal. These are examples of justice and mercy. Uh, To kill is not a reference to murder. That's a different word, but most likely to capital punishment. And then to heal is, it refers to physical restoration. There is an appointed time for both. Next, he says, there is a time to tear down and a time to build up. In 1 Kings chapter 6, Solomon builds the temple, retiring the tabernacle that was built in the wilderness en route to the promised land and used all the way through up to to King David's rule. And though David intended to build the temple, he was prevented because he was not the appointed man and it was not the appointed time. It was reserved rather for his son Solomon. And Solomon erected the beautiful temple at the appointed time in 957 B.C. However, due to Israel's sins of idolatry and breaking of the covenant, God announced the appointed time for judgment on his people. And then in 2 Kings chapter 25, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, lays siege to Jerusalem and tears down the temple. And the Israelites are taken into exile. And then after 70 years of captivity in Babylon, according to God's predetermined plan, Babylon changed hands with with the Persians, and, and God sent his people back to the land because it was the appointed time to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And of course, God appoints the times of events, but did you know that he even appoints the expressing of emotions, the appointed time for the expressing of emotions. Look down at verse 4. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. When you're, when you're going through trials, it's almost impossible to laugh. It's just not the time for it. It would be inappropriate. But in the mercy of God, there comes a time that the distress and the pain seems to dissipate and God appoints a time for laughter and joy again. My wife and I had an experience with these two emotions just this weekend. On Friday, we attended the funeral of a dear relative of hers. 
that's been loved by many in the family. There was, there was grief, there was weeping, there was sorrow. It was a time for mourning. A beloved person who we will never see on this side again. However, perhaps an hour or two later, the same people who were weeping were now laughing. There was joy again. God comforted grieving people by giving them laughter. Their loss is still there, but the pain is a little less now. And now God has, has given the appointed time for laughter. The common grace of God. Now that was Friday. Now around this time yesterday, we celebrated a wedding of a dear couple in my Bible study that I've been leading for the past nine years. And one of the men there gave a toast to the bride and the groom, and he mentioned how this particular day, their wedding day, this day of rejoicing, was a day that God preordained in his plan before the foundation of the world. And he was right. It was the appointed time that God established for rejoicing and dancing. It was appropriate. Now look at verse 5 a time to throw stones, and a time to gather stones. In ancient Israel, stones could be used to carry out justice or, or even warfare, but those same stones could be used to commemorate a union or to establish a covenant. God appoints the time for both the usage of those stones. And then he says a time for, to embrace and a time to shun embracing. This is in regard to human relationships. To embrace indicates endearment, affection, and comfort. And to, to shun embracing indicates a break from that, a disunity in the relationship for a particular reason. A break in fellowship, communion. These can be painful times, especially in the context of church. Unfortunately, the longer you walk in the faith, the more times you, you may have to unfortunately experience this where you, there may be certain men or women in your life who walk away from the Lord because they were never really saved to begin with. People that you used to call your brother or sister, they named the name of Christ and included themselves in the assembly of the saints. But uh, as 1 John chapter 2, verse 19 says, they went out from us but they were not really of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not all of us. And unfortunately for, for these people, Matthew 18 says that we can't call them brother anymore. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we can't in good conscience be seated even at the same table with them and enjoy the, the same type of fellowship that we had with them before. We must deal with them as unbelievers now, calling them to repentance. It becomes a appointed time for that facade to be shown and for that relationship to end. And God even appoints times with our possessions in chapter, in verse 6. He says a time to search and a time to give up what is lost and a a time to keep and a time to throw away. And this is, this is the life of my wife and I right now. We're in the process of moving, and we're looking for things, and we're losing things because everything is all over the place and can't find stuff. And at the same time, we're having to make decisions on what to keep and what to throw away. And then look at verse 7. It says, a time to tear apart and a time to sew together. This this word tear apart can refer to the ancient Jewish practice of rending or tearing a garment to express grief over the loss of a loved one. It symbolized the tearing apart of the heart. Again, a response to the appointed time of grief. But a time to sew together could mean to replace or repair those torn clothes, indicating that the time of grief has passed and it's time to move Move on with life. Then he says, there's a time to be silent and a time to speak. In Proverbs 
Solomon refers to silence as an exercise in wisdom. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 12, he says, He who despises his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding keeps silent. Proverbs 10, verse 19 says, When there are many words, salvation, I mean, um, a transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Silence in many cases is, is more important than speaking, especially when something that, that could be said inappropriately or sinfully is at hand. And that's why those who speak their mind are considered to be foolish and arrogant. Yet on the other hand, Solomon also says that there is an appointed time for wise and, and helpful speech. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 23, and a man has a joy, has joy in an apt answer, and how delightful is a timely word. Proverbs 25, verse 11, like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. And then finally in verse 8, it says, a time, of, a time to love and a time to hate, a time to for war and the time for peace. These can also refer to human relationships or even diplomatic relationships. Wars can signal the appointed time of Christ's imminent return. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, Jesus says, You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. All these events have been appointed and predetermined by God himself. Again, Derek Kidner says that these events are imposed upon us here on this earth. And this is further illustrated by the fact that he says that no one chooses a time to mourn. And then we look at eternity in verses 9 through 11. Verse 9 through 11. Look at verse 9 says, what profit is there to the worker from that with, with, in which he toils? Uh, a familiar refrain, a rhetorical question that Solomon asks all throughout this book. Uh, a question he asks when he's having to deal with the reality that life is just beyond his control. But this time he asks it in a way, in a context, after recounting the deliberate appointed times that God used to affect man's destiny, uh, bringing upon himself unplanned and emit, unmitigated periods of, of loss and grief, that what he has built will be torn down, what he has gained will at some point be lost. And Solomon asks, how can there be profit if it's all subject to loss? One commentator said, these activities have been described as being under the absolute and final control of God. He says, try, to try to be active and to, to exercise control in the area where God is in control, prophets one nothing. <clears throat> and next he says in verse 10, he says, I have seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. It's as if Solomon is saying that God gives man these activities to just keep him busy. That God is the one that's really in control here. And yet he says in the next verse, he has made everything appropriate in its time. This word translated appropriate can also be translated beautiful. He's made everything beautiful in its time. Though on a purely human level, these events that that we don't like, are random and uncontrollable. But from the standpoint of God and his awesome providence, these events in our lives that take place are intricately woven through the fabric of life and used for a purpose far, far beyond anything that we can conceive. I mean, through the lineage of Christ's bloodline, through his lineage, there were scandals and there were adulteries. Solomon himself being the product of a union that was initially established from David's sinful lust, as Solomon's mother was Bathsheba, the woman David illegally took when, he, when she was still the, the wife of 
David's soldier Uriah. And yet through this very troubled bloodline comes the Son of God. And you might identify with this if you really contemplate what, what, what events brought you to the place where you are right now. I'm sure that in your life there were many trials and, and maybe even tragedies that occurred before you, you came to exist on this planet. Even in your own life, certain events, fortunate and unfortunate, pleasant and horrible, may have been instrumental into leading you to Christ. And God brought them about in his time for his glory and for your ultimate good. And so when you take a step back and you consider these things, they're overwhelmingly beautiful to you, are they not? You might even tear up just thinking about it. Even weeping and mourning are in the sovereign plan of a a loving and faithful God. Yet the realization of the, the fleeting, uncontrolled circumstances in life producing us a dissatisfaction for the temporal and, 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 and a desire for what's lasting, what's, what's stable, what's e- eternal. And this is why he said he has also set eternity in their heart. Because inwardly, we, we, we all want rest. We want a sense of permanence. And this is especially true for for those of us who are in Christ and look forward to the day when we can can leave this this passing, fleeting, sinful, cursed world behind and uh, and are at rest in heaven. And this is a reality that only those in Christ have to look forward to. The the desire to to escape the curse that will be We'll be, we'll be enjoying God's presence and we will experience for the first time satisfaction in due time. In fact, turn with me to Romans chapter 8, 18. Romans chapter 8. Verse 18. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Verse 19, For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of the body. Notice those words, anxiously longing, waiting eagerly. Words of expectation and anticipation. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then look at chapter 5, verse 4. He says, for indeed while we are in this tent, this, this, this bodily, temporary dwelling place that we're in, he says, we groan being burdened, because we don't want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are pleasant from the Lord. 
for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body, to be at home with the Lord. This is the eternity that we desire. And this only becomes attractive when you realize that this is not home for us. That this is temporary. And this is, there's, there's no lasting value here to be derived and, 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 and achieved out of this world. That we are only here to do the will of God while we are here. And, and to live for eternity that is being prepared for each one of us who belong to him. I look back at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 really quick. Getting ready to close here. Solomon says that God has set eternity in man's hearts. But at the same time, he says, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from beginning even to the end. Man will never be able to understand all that God has instituted. I mean, we have the scriptures, but we, we still have questions that will go unanswered. Some of those events mentioned previously leave us, they, they leave us currently with, with questions. Like why? Why did that have to happen? And even when there are answers to life's questions, what God does and, and why he does what he does, the answers that we get are unsatisfactory to us. They don't make sense to finite beings with limited understanding. But that's where, where trust comes in, right? That we know God's character, that he's good and that he's, he's faithful, that he's the definition of love, that he's holy, that he's not like us, that his plans and his purposes transcend our short and fleeting lives and the world uh, does not revolve around us but rather that he has appointed time and events to bring about his sovereign plans that are both for his glory and for his good. Amen?